Welcome and thank you for joining us in the session Build Back Better – Digital Healthcare in Asia – Opportunity to Integrate Health Systems, Care Pathways and Personalize Healthcare – Moderated by Kawaldip Semi, the CEO at the International Alliance of Patients' Organizations. Uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at this session. We're just waiting for one uh, participant to join us. As you know, technology is always uh, what, what they call the lame leg uh, of conferences. But uh, we have with us uh, this afternoon a very good speaker who will start integrating some of the core issues that are there. I sit on our personal healthcare councils and have been pushing this forward for a long time, that uh, digital technologies are really the way forward uh, in that they help us uh, prevent some of the patient harm that is resulting from standard healthcare. Plus, uh, digital technologies help us to integrate health systems that were disparate. And as you know, there is no industry left uh, right now that hasn't been affected by a disruption technology. We have uh, moved away from how we traded, how we work together, and even how our love lives are oriented. I think some of the uh, sites that came out and search engines and all these things. So we would like to reflect on why is that the healthcare industry is slow to tackle, uh, tackle this. Now, uh, Kulbir Sandhu is the APEC uh, regional head and vice president of digital strategy for Roche Pharma. Uh, he's uh, working out of Singapore, and uh, Kulbir has a great experience uh, in, in a track record of creating new products and then finding that uh, strategic solution for developing innovative care for that. He's not only uh, very savvy with the technological care pathways that you need, but he's also savvy with patient needs and very close to that. Kubir uh, has had uh, an amazing experience within the Asia Pacific region, and he knows it so well and has led some of the key um, uh, moments and key devices that were manufactured. And one of the things that I liked about Kubir's approach was that uh, he always puts the patient first. And I think he said it quite clearly that we start with the patient and the product follows. So Kubir, over to you to address us and then we'll join for the second speaker. Thank you, Kulbir. All right, uh, thank you, Kulbir, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for inviting me to kind of share my learnings and also um, I really learned from, uh, from, from the audience as well. Uh, so let me, let me just quickly share my screen with you first. Okay, can you see it? Yes, we can, thank you. All right, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. Um, so I think as Paul Deep said, um, so I'm, I'm the regional head for, uh, for Raj Pharma. Uh, based out of Singapore, and, and my focus is uh, pretty much on digital. This um, that uh, we focus on and patients. Uh, so every day, uh, I think my focus is to um, really strive for these innovations so that we can reach uh, to to our customers and our patients, and provide something which is accessible, uh, which is cheaper, and also has has a great uh, clinical outcomes. So let me just kind of um, uh, talk about in terms of what's the future of healthcare. Uh, so within uh, within pharma, I think uh, there's quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of focus on personalized healthcare. Uh, for us, every patient is unique. Uh, what I mean by this is that uh, health is actually very personal, 
And we also believe that healthcare should be personalized as well. Um, so as the, the shift uh, in the healthcare delivery is actually moving from provider-centric to patient-centric, uh, where the patients is actually want to take um, a lot more control over the healthcare delivery, and also want to play a very active role in terms of what the treatment options should be, uh, what different options are available for them uh, in terms of funding. Uh, so they want to play a very equal role uh, in that decision-making process. And, and digital technology, I think from my perspective, is going to play a very important role uh, when we look at the new healthcare delivery models. So other thing which is, which is important when you look, at, look out in the future is that uh, the role of a doctor or a physician is going to be more about providing the right guidance and interpretation of data uh, to our patients. So a lot of, lot of patients, um, uh, their expectation for healthcare delivery is, uh, is synonymous to actually opening a bank account or running your, your financial transaction with your bank to be able to transfer the money. Uh, so they want to do in their own terms. They want to do it you know, whenever, they want, whenever they want it. So when you look at the diagram on the right side here, uh, so this has actually been a consistent feedback uh, for a lot, of, a lot of our patients. So first of all, any healthcare delivery should have better clinical outcomes. Uh, so patients, they want to get well and they want to stay well. So this is the number one priority for us to make sure that whatever innovations we have, the medications we have, that we drive for the better clinical outcomes. The number two here on, on this triangle is basically convenience. So a lot of our patients are looking for a convenient way of delivery of healthcare. They want the healthcare on their own terms. That means wherever they are um, and, and whenever they want it. And the last one is affordability. I think the affordability uh, is an extremely important component of healthcare delivery today. So if we can make um, the healthcare and medication uh, affordable, then, then we can really um, improve our market access and patient access for a lot of these medication and innovations. The quality of care and cost of care will continue to drive the healthcare innovations. So when you look at a lot of the innovations today in, ter in terms of digital transformation, they are all around improving the healthcare outcomes and also bringing the affordability um, uh, in, in the paradigm so that people can actually uh, buy all these medication, buy all these drugs, and, and get better and get well. Uh, in order to transform this new paradigm of healthcare, uh, the integrated public to private partnership is going to be extremely important. Uh, comes first, and a lot of the innovations. Uh, to make sure that these medication and innovations actually reach to our patients uh, so that we can drive the better, better clinical outcomes for our patients. So in the new paradigm where the patients have a lot of different expectations, uh, they're also evolving expectations of peers, providers, everybody talks about their data, uh, but the data is only useful if we are able to drive some meaningful, actionable insight out of these uh, data sources. Um, and this, this element is actually extremely important when we focus on personalized healthcare, is how can we actually deploy some predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics so that we can provide uh, an insight which will drive a clear uh, a number of decisions in the healthcare, uh, I think, should be made based on the data, and the data-driven approach is going to be um, imperative to healthcare delivery going forward. Uh, then the technology is, even though it's an enabler, I think it's fully embedded into the patient journey. So when you look at a lot of different touch points uh, along the patient journey, even though we are converting those touch points into digital, but what does really mean for, for the patients? 
right? So there has to be a value creation and value uh, propagation for our customers and our patients. Um, digital health, I think we talked about this, that is really is the fundamental or foundation of healthcare delivery in the future. And I will just talk about some examples um, uh, in, in the next slide. And then also when you look at the expectation from the peers, um, the healthcare is moving towards evidence-based healthcare. Uh, you know, if, if it's not effective, uh, if it's not driving the clinical um, outcomes for our patients, uh, so that means that the payers are not going to pay for it. So how do we make sure that we have enough data, real-world data and evidence uh, to be able to show the efficacy uh, and, and better clinical outcomes age with our patients are getting well and, and are staying well? So in terms of um, uh, technology and how it's helping, helping the patients, uh, so I think, you know, we all heard about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning. Uh, there are tons and tons of those applications today where it's been successfully deployed uh, to drive some of these productive analytics. But the, at, at the end of the day, um, I think this is one of the core pillars uh, for delivering a personalized healthcare so that uh, the data can actually influence the clinical, the better clinical outcomes for our DASIC example has been around for 30 years. But because of this pandemic, I think it just kind of opened the floodgate where we have seen an amazing transformation and acceleration in adoption of telehealth, uh, where the healthcare uh, could be delivered in the, in the comfort of patients' home and hence reducing a huge amount of burden on HCOs. And that provides the convenience and affordability. I think there are a lot of number of use cases which are coming up where telehealth is gonna stay here for long term. And um, we have seen quite a bit of transformation, not just from the vendors of tele telehealth, but also from peers uh, where you know, prescriptions are actually reimbursable in, in a lot of, lot of affiliates with an APAC. Uh, because of the advent of digital uh, and, the, and the Facebooks of the world or um, the Netflix of the world, I think we have, some, we have seen similar transformation uh, within healthcare as well. Um, so today we can actually create uh, communities or e-communities of patients and physicians uh, with, with uh, the click, uh, with a mouse click, and then bring uh, this, what we call peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, in a setting where it's going to be one-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many -many sort of interactions where we can build awareness around prevention. Um, and these tools are amazing for continued medical education um, and also being used as one of the key um, virtual channels uh, for creating awareness and patient educations uh, around the new medicines and, and new healthcare solutions. The last one over here is uh, just with the proliferation of uh, wearables and smartphones, uh, and, and they can really provide value in terms of continuous real-time monitoring of the patients. So I think one of the things we have seen with pandemic where people couldn't even come back to their doctor's office for follow-up, uh, but they were actually able to use telehealth to be able to call their doctor. A lot of these wearables uh, to get their vital information to the doctors so that we have a 24 hour uh, view of their vital information in case they run into any, um, any problems. So, just kind of expanding a little bit on, on personalized healthcare. Um, so the, the data-driven approach, uh, as I said, is going to be one of the core pillars of the future of healthcare. And uh, it's, it's already happening in a lot of the circles and a lot of, uh, lot of affiliates with an APAC. Uh, so the data from um, genomics, EMR, patient reported outcomes, uh, digital health, uh, imaging, of course, 
and pathology, I think is all kind of feeding into um, the algorithms or the massive amount of data uh, where we can deploy these algorithms to um, uh, provide what I call assistive support uh, for physicians and uh, medical uh, practitioners uh, for faster diagnosis and really aid them uh, in some of these uh, mundane tasks where we can drive some of these efficiencies within the healthcare system. Uh, so by providing this uh, high resolution view of each and every patient and their disease uh, progression and their genomics, I think we can really drive uh, better outcomes in terms of um, uh, clinical trials, um, uh, better disease monitoring using uh, remote patient monitoring, and then also uh, we want to make sure that uh, they have better access to, to, to our medication and, and innovations. Um, so with that, uh, uh, you know, I think we are highly focused on uh, in terms of doing now what our patients uh, need next. Thank you. Uh, thank you much, Gobert. Uh, just to, just to set this in there, we've got a couple of questions from the chat that are being sent over. And the one uh, question that they've asked is, uh, how do you envisage, uh, or do you think there is a role for additional technologies to play in improving cross-border healthcare? Uh, this is something being put in the grounds that within the Asia Pacific region, you have, for instance, Singapore on the way at the top, and then you have some other, say Cambodia at the lower end of the development. Would it be sufficient uh, for patients uh, in Cambodia to access uh, patients in Singapore? Is there a role if you have a unified standard setup? Absolutely. I, th I think that's, uh, uh, that's a great question. Uh, so with the advent of digital technology and availability or access to this massive amount of data, uh, the access and pri patient privacy is of uh, extremely important. We want to make sure that uh, when it comes to patient data, uh, that uh, you know, we pay attention to uh, the cybersecurity and, and, uh, and the privacy of patient data. Uh, but however, uh, I think when you look at the telehealth model, for example, Indonesia, who will generally go to um, either Thailand or maybe, in, maybe come to Singapore uh, for uh, medical tourism, mm -hmm. and often they go back to their, their parent country or their native countries uh, for follow-ups. Uh, so usually they come back every three months or six months, but because of this situation, they were actually not allowed to travel back. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as long as they can give consent to that data sharing, uh, then in a lot of different affiliates, that data migration or data interoperability, I think is, is possible. However, there's still, still a challenge in terms of um, uh, how do we make sure that the data is consistent? So all this debate about EMRs and EHRs, uh, mm -hmm. because the data exists in a very, very fragmented uh, uh, fashion. Uh, so even if you make a data available and the data can flow from across borders, how do you make sure that it's meaningful? Uh, so Rosh is part of this, um, uh, this global alliance uh, called Global Data Alliance. Uh, we're, we're primarily, we are focused on um, how do we make sure that uh, the these kind of barriers are removed uh, so that uh, we can really uh, seamlessly share data, uh, patient data, and also data between private hospitals and public hospitals uh, to be able to provide the best outcomes uh, for our patients. Uh, so it is work in progress, uh, but I think a lot of this has with patient consent and also making sure that which is HIPAA compliant and we can anonymize a lot of this data uh, for patient privacy. And uh, then that will open up some of the floodgates 
to be able to share that data and make use of it uh, for driving better clinical outcomes for our patients. Uh, excellent. Uh, there's another one from Ismail Saeed. Uh, he wants to look at, uh, he says, uh, will value-based provider payment models instead of the traditional fixed salary of fee-for-service receive greater traction in 2021 as we all go towards recognizing the role of digital healthcare. What's your opinion on that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, you know, again, with, with, uh, with the advent of digital technology um, and, and the multi-cloud system which are available to us where we can look at and analyze massive amount of data. I think the traditional model where we rely on uh, randomized clinical trials mm. uh, for, um, uh, for basically uh, for the efficacy and safety of these drugs um, it is not sufficient going forward. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis on the real world data and the real world evidence to generate enough evidence so that we can actually go back to our policy shapers and, and um, uh, regulators to drive decisions that a lot of these a lot of these us. And that model in conjunction with the data from the clinical trial. I think it's going to be extremely important for bringing a lot of these innovation to, to the market. And, and the beauty of all this is that today we do have the tools and infrastructures to be able to analyze this massive amount of data to generate that evidence uh, where we can go back and look at how effective and, and how they're doing and, and uh, you know, start taking that prescription to the point where we can analyze this data if there's a positive trend on their disease progression, then it becomes very compelling evidence of, and sometimes even approval of a lot of these drugs and medications. Uh, something else that's uh, come through for, this is I think one of our European Union uh, colleagues is saying that, um, uh, how do you envisage uh, maybe the APAC, the, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation and then the ASEAN Agreement? Uh, what role do you think they could play in advancing this? Uh, for instance, like you have had with the uh, European Union pushing digital healthcare as its major economic priority. I and mean, they've, they've said that the digital healthcare is an economic priority. Uh, can they help us support this? Um, yeah, I think uh, as I alluded to, um, uh, in, in the journey of this transformation of healthcare to the future, um, so the, the whole ecosystem needs to come together okay. in order to advance the science and to commercialization where we can actually put a lot of these innovations into our patients' hands. Um, so policy formulation is, is extremely important. Um, for the adoption of a lot of these digital technologies and maybe removing some of the barriers. And I think there are, there are a number of examples where, uh, especially in the APAC, uh, where policy around reimbursement and getting access uh, to the data system within a public hospital. Uh, require some policy changes to be able to be ready for adoption. How do we make sure that the clinical workflow in the, in the public hospital can be able to adopt so that uh, we can make these innovations available to our, to our patients? So I think that collaboration with policymakers, with the um, with Ministry of Health, um, and a number of these are really next level, we can actually make them accessible to our patient population. Uh, so extremely important. Very, very uh, thank, for the success. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, now I've got uh, Dr. Sanjay Sud. Uh, Dr. Sanjay? 
Have we lost him again? Um, could you raise him up again, someone? Okay. Um, uh, production, could you just check with Dr. Sanjay? Yes, okay, let, let's continue the discussion. I, I would like to now maybe, maybe share some of the experience that uh, we have been having uh, within the overall uh, European Union context that uh, big data and... Uh, hi, Dr. Sanjay, can you hear us? Dr. Sanjay? Uh, Dr. Sanjay, if you can hear us, please. Uh, I think you're muted at the moment. Uh, if you yes, I'm back. I'm 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 back. I'm back, okay. sir. Uh, thank thank you much. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome, Dr. Sanjay. I know you have IT issues going on, but uh, don't worry. If you think you can be off with your with your videos, no problem. We know the broadman, uh, uh, Dr. Sanjay. That we have just uh, Kulbir has just set the ball now to, uh, to say that we have to now bring in the issue of. Um, uh, how we have to uh, interact with some of the technology. And you have uh, come across with the excellent solution of uh, e-Sanjeevni. And I think uh, the term itself is a very uh, interesting one in that uh, e-health uh, is talking of um, way out there and uh, Sanjeevni was the herb uh, the god uh, uh, Hanumanji was asked to go look for in the mountains. And, you know, because of his uh, botanical knowledge he was not uh, there. And I think it, today you have got apps which can identify herbs quickly. You can, you can take reverse pictures. And uh, he, bless him he, for his uh, failings, uh, solved the problem by lifting the whole mountain and carrying it over to Sri Lanka. So. E Sanjeevni, uh, is that a mountain of a uh, task? Uh, is it very easy? Is it uh, exactly, exactly, uh, exactly, sir? In fact, we we, we have been um, we have been working towards putting this solution together and enabling uh, the services, remote services, or delivery of uh, health services remotely to the populace uh, in the country. And we are uh, so happy to share with you that we've already. Um, uh, sort of uh, completed uh, close to around nine and a half, uh, 950,000 uh, consultations in the country. And um, uh, in, uh, in India, as you know, uh, the penetration of smartphone is um, close to around um, 37, 38%. So we do face a huge challenge to reach out to the populace um, beyond 37%. And um, and then health is a state subject here in the country. We, um, we have had few innovative um, processes and techniques which have been deployed by various state governments to ensure um, the, the, uh, the access of e Sanjeevni or access of health services through e Sanjeevni, uh, wherein uh, the community health officers are using this technology. The patients come to them, poor patients or the populace in the rural areas, they come to them uh, especially the patients who do not have smartphones, um, they they come to these uh, sub centers or primary health centers, and the community health officers facilitate telemedicine consultations with them or teleconsultations for them um, by uh, by using a feature which we have been built into it, which um, which enables these community health officers to create the profiles of these um, rural uh, patients or patients in the rural areas. Um, who do not have smartphones, they create their profiles and the community health officers uh, generate a token in e Sanjeevni for these patients. And then um, as soon as their turn comes, they get these patients consulted through e Sanjeevni um, using the, the video consultation um, mode and get them the e-prescription done. So that is, that is one modality um, or the process uh, which has got very popular. And um, daily, we are doing around 11 to 12,000 consultations uh, in the country using e Sanjeevni. We have 250 OPDs running concurrently um, in e Sanjeevni. And I would say close to around 30% of the patients are those who do not have smartphones. So that is, that is something um, which is making telemedicine useful for even those who are neither IT literate or neither IT savvy. 
and not uh, rich enough to um, possess or own a smartphone. So um, that is how um, telemedicine is not only assisting or enabling um, healthcare services for, for people like us who are IT literate or who can afford PCs, laptops, and um, smartphones, but it is also uh, making the ends meet for those who do not have um, such technologies um, for them. So that is one um, uh, great use of East and Jeevni, which has um, led to uh, some, some good propagation of the, the technology in the rural areas as well. And then we have another model, which is majorly um, being used for doctor to doctor consultation. Smaller clinics where we do not have specialists, primary health centers, they have medical officers, the patients come to them and the medical officers, they have access to East and Jeevni and they are connect, these are acting as spokes and they are these spokes are connected with the hubs and the patients, um, uh, the, the queries of the patients or when the medical officer feels that the case is beyond their um, capacity, then they create a case, a patient case on East and Jeevni, get them consulted through the doctors or the specialists in the hub and that is how um, the second model of doctor to doctor teleconsultation is also being uh, utilized. And I guess um, this is how uh, the Indian government is um, enabling telemedicine services in the areas where uh, otherwise the health services and in fact, the specialist services are not available. Kaldeep, you are on mute. Kaldeep, you're muted. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, one of the questions that was raised this morning earlier on was accrediting accreditation of uh, operators who are working in telehealth and uh, bringing them uh, into one common standard and bringing them as equal to par with the health professionals. Uh, would this help us uh, if uh, we can develop a standard like this? And uh, how do you envisage that could go? Uh, to Sanjeev, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, Sanjeev. Yeah. Um, pardon, sir. If you could, if you could rephrase uh, the the query, I missed okay. something. Okay, one of the issues raised this morning was uh, improving the standard of uh, e-health uh, operators. Uh, that is. Uh, either the people managing the services or the frontline staff. Uh, so they don't they want to see that go down the track of uh, just becoming a call center or something like that. Do you think accreditation will improve access and quality? Yes, yes, yes indeed. Indeed. Um, in the telemedicine practice guidelines issued by the government of India, um, they do talk about telemedicine training, um, be it the registered medical practitioner or be it a paramedic who's enabling the consultation with uh, between the patient and the doctor as, as we are using. And we train uh, the health workers or the paramedics to use Isanjeevni and we ensure that um, the, the paramedics are competent enough to, um, to, to use uh, telemedicine platform. And it is only then um, they, they are, they are um, uh, sort of onboarded on the system and accreditation will certainly help um, agencies like, I guess, Telemedicine Society of India here in, in the country um, has been running a similar training program for uh, not only doctors, but also for paramedics and health workers. And many states like Tamil Nadu in South um, Uttar Pradesh in North and Uttarakhand as well and Gujarat is, um, in the West, uh, they, they are utilizing uh, health workers and um, paramedics also to enable uh, consultations between the patients and doctors. So, so these trainings or accreditation will certainly help. Okay. Thank you much. And uh, to... Uh, yeah, just, uh, if I if I may just kind of uh, build up what uh, Dr. Sanjay said, um, I think there are two or three different models around telemedicine. Um, uh, so th there's, um, I think the one which is going to evolve for long term is really telemedicine as a service. Uh, so a lot of these vendors. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, yes. Okay. Hello. Oh, okay. Yes, we can hear so, you. So so telemedicine. 
uh, telemedicine as a service, I think it's going, to, it's going to become actually one of the evolved models when we look down maybe four or five years from now. Uh, so there's quite a bit of push with an APAC uh, where these telemedicine uh, clinics are actually providing infrastructure um, and, and framework uh, for traditional brick and mortar clinic to be turned into a telemedicine hubs. Mm -hmm. uh, or spokes. And I think uh, uh, one model which is evolving with an APAC is what we call hub and spoke, mm -hmm. uh, where in a lot of the Linux, uh, low to medium income countries, you can pretty much connect with a specialist anywhere mm -hmm. in the world, even outside of APAC, to be able to bring that case management into a local setting using telemedicine model. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the infrastructure uh, for those is actually sold by these vendors who are creating this, uh, what we call telemedicine as a, as a, as a service, uh, which, which uh, is going to evolve what we call offline online model, which is very, becoming very popular uh, within Asia, as well as in China as well. Well, th thank you, Kubir. I think that was very good. And that last question before we shut the session, what is the role of uh, digital health in educating and developing the doctors and community workers. And I'll split the question for digital health for doctors, health professionals to Kulbir and then to Sanjay for the ASHAs and all those who will be using these um, things. So Kulbir, first of all, you know, yeah. what role do they play? Um, I think it's, a, it's an in, incredible opportunity uh, to do this, you know, basically digital platform uh, for, uh, for education, uh, both for uh, physicians and as well as I think building communities, patient communities as well, and uh, ACPs. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of trend and innovation in that space, uh, what we call a critical webinar channel for multi-channel strategy for customer engagement. Uh, so essentially it's a creation of uh, Facebook of, uh, of healthcare. Uh, and also using these communities or e-communities, um, you can push contents, you can build communities, you can have peer-to-peer -peer reviews, uh, you can exchange a lot of the scientific data on different products and, and um, build that knowledge base uh, using these tools and technologies, which I think is gonna evolve and, and transform healthcare uh, onto a platform where both patient and doctors can come together and jointly make decisions around treatment option, about funding, and also about clinical outcomes. So on one end, I think we, we can create these communities, create these pods, and then empower our patients. And then we bring in the doctors where they play the role of as a guidance or as interpreter for a lot of these information. And this is all possible uh, because, of, um, okay. uh, because of digital technology. And the second one is the AI. So, AI is gonna be extremely important assistive technology, which uh, I think is gonna be extremely useful for doctors so they can really focus on, uh, on the human interaction and leave a lot of the other work uh, to, to digital, digital technology and digital health. Okay, excellent, thank you. And now question to Sanjay. I think we have seen great models of, um, for instance, our very earlier days, there used to be the experiment called the hole in the wall where they left these computers inside these uh, boxes and very soon the villages got interactive and they were programming things. So how, much of the uh, rural innovation that comes through in uh, connectivity is through rural areas. I think we should not be letting those down. So what do you think about East and Jivni, Asha's, and can we see a model for low and middle income countries coming through there? where um, Isan Jivni takes on the educational role and um, the, the enabling environment, hot housing ideas. Yes, yes, it does. As um, Dr. Sandhu has mentioned, uh, digital health or AI and uh, similar other uh, modalities like machine learning, et cetera, they've added a complete new dimension to the whole um, ecosystem of uh, the, the practice of medicine, not only for the clinicians, but also for the health workers or uh, for paramedics as well, because um, the frontline or the first level uh, health workers are the ones who are actually um, connected with or are connecting with the masses. And um, learning for, for them is, is uh, equally important. 
and um, tools and platforms or communities as um, Dr. Sandhu has been uh, talk, has, has mentioned, uh, these can certainly play a very um, important role to, uh, to enhance um, the, the experiences and knowledge and capabilities of these health workers, especially. And um, India, um, incidentally or fortunately, has, um, has taken the lead in uh, using telemedicine technology at this scale and uh, not only uh, taken lead in using telemedicine, but has also taken lead in utilizing the, the frontline health workers, uh, especially in the rural areas. And they have utilized uh, that workforce for um, connecting um, the digital health medium or telemedicine with the patients who otherwise would not have um, uh, shown up on, um, on, on telemedicine. So their, uh, their knowledge and their capacities and their competencies um, certainly need to be built and um, media and digital health um, can really, um, uh, you know, um, um, project them to a level uh, where, where they can be, they can be seen as role models at the global level in the lower uh, income or lower or middle income uh, countries across the world. And uh, we are already working on a project for the government of India, wherein uh, the other version of e-Sanjeevani will be rolled out for the entire African continent, uh, wherein the African clinicians or the doctors in, in almost more than 50 countries of Africa uh, will be able to seek um, opinion or um, um, will be able to uh, discuss the cases with uh, the experts and specialists in, in, in leading tertiary level hospitals in the country. So that is how um, the, the whole experience or the whole idea of, um, of rolling out uh, such e telemedicine or e-health services um, uh, to the other parts of the world or other countries uh, from India is, is basically rooted in these experiences that, um, that, uh, that, that the health workers or the health administrators are learning, are, are earning through uh, the use of visa Jeevni. So we-, uh, th we Thank you. We, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I think we'll, we'll invite you for an African Congress. We are planning one for next year. That would be very good to Great. have you there uh, speak for us. Uh, thank you both speakers. Sorry about the technological uh, problems we had earlier to connecting people, but that's, I think I leave it to the state to look at, maybe we should have better broadband everywhere in the world, <laughs> better connectivity, but that's for them to know. So I think that we have seen this. I thank the audience who have joined us. Uh, many of you have had very pertinent questions. Uh, we couldn't answer this now, but I think if you email those to us, I will pass them on to the speakers themselves and see how we can address them later during the week. And thank you very much. And uh, please do join us after the break. Have a nice mobility break, stretch up, do your yoga, whatever you have to do. And I'll see you across the break. Thank you very much, speakers again. Kulbir Sandhu and Sanjay Sud. Excellent thank speakers. You, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you. you.